singularity. My name is Nicola, and you're watching Singularity FM, the place where we interview the future. Today, my guest on the show is someone you might recognize, Mr. Boltai. I mean, Bill Nye, the science yes, guy. Yes. Bill. Blow it up. It's been two years I've been waiting to do this with you, man. Thank right, you good. so good. much. Great. Good. Thank you so much. So let me ask you this. Um, I grew up behind the Iron Curtain in Bulgaria, so I never actually had the pleasure and the chance to watch your show when I was growing up as a kid. So let's assume a, a portion of my audience never did that too. If I were to ask you to introduce your own self in your own couple of words, who is Bill Nye? A uh, science educator, mechanical engineer for 20 years in aerospace. Now I want to get people to become scientifically literate, to solve the world's three big problems, clean water, renewable, reliable electricity for everyone, and access to the internet, or whatever the future of electronic information worldwide is called. Let's go. Very interesting. We're going to get to those big problems. But before that, I want to talk a little bit more about you. And is there any sort of difference between the science guy and the actual Bill Nye? Yes. If so, you watch the science guy show, have you ever seen a kung fu movie? Yes. So he moves his hands and it doesn't happen in real life. It doesn't. And is there one thing that the real Bill Nye is different from the science guy that you can share with us? Yeah, so when I sip water, I don't always spit it out. The science guy, a lot of times, <laughs> spit it out. No, I mean, the science guy was a show for kids, and I, was, I am a performer, and I performed that show. Yeah. But now, I, the show exists, 100 shows, people watch it. I was in London, uh, it was about a month ago, and people watch the show in London, teenagers, uh, yeah. you know, elementary kids. Uh, yeah, people 8, 10 years old are watching it. So I don't need to make those shows anymore. They still exist. Now I'm doing this other thing to yes. get people excited about science. And I've been binging on those, by the way. So I watched almost the whole season of uh, Bill Nye Saves the World. Oh, really? On I Netflix. Love you, man. And then I watched uh, the fantastic uh, upcoming documentary that we're all here for. You've seen that? I've oh, seen wow. it twice, actually. Wow. Produced by our friends uh, Jason Sassberg and David Alvarado. Yep. Great job. And Kate McLean and Nick Pampanello. And a whole other team behind that, of course. Uh, however, let me ask you this. Um, in that movie, you say that all you're trying to do is you're just trying to play the hand you were dealt. That's right. What does that mean? So I, first of all, I was born a guy of European descent in the US. Where from? What European descent? Uh, my uh, Denmark and France. Interesting, okay. okay. My grandmother was French, she was an immigrant. Very cool. Uh, uh, but the Nyes, or Nia, came from Denmark in the 1600s, in the 17th century, so. Wow. I'm, so I'm, what am I gonna do? I was born here, in, or rather born in the US. Uh, so I grew up with this tradition of academic achievement in my family, and I came of age during the space program. So I'm, of course, excited about science. Then when I saw the United States produce the Ford Pinto car, <laughs> the Chevy Vega took the solar panels off the roof of the White House because the guy just didn't believe in this sort of hippie energy or something. Yeah. And then the United States eschewed or set aside or stopped teaching the metric system. And I just went, this is not the future. This is bad news. And so I started, I wanted to have a show about kids so that we'd have a generation of scientifically literate people someday. But why do you think that's your burden? Why do you think it's you who has to step up to the plate and be it save the world or promote science and, and show people the importance of science? Well, you do a radio show, a podcast. Yeah. Why do you do that? I do it. You like to perform. You're a performer. You're interested in people. Okay, so same deal. I like to perform. I did stand-up comedy for a while, or I tried to. And uh, wow! So it's a convergence of my interests of performing, trying to be funny, and science. What's not to love? So what's the priority? Saving the world or trying to be funny and performing? Right. And is there any tension between the TV 
uh, personality and the scientist. Is there a price to be paid for that celebrity? Uh, well, the price for celebrity these days is lack of privacy. That is, that is a price. Uh, but does it hurt you as a scientist or as a person on a well, mission? It's, as it's you seem a to distraction. Be? Yeah, it's distracting. Yeah. But that aside. Uh, I want to use humor and entertainment to get people excited about science. Yes. Now, I had done some engineering. I designed some parts on some airplanes yep. that anybody with reasonable skills could design, but I'm proud of them. I was there. I did the job. And uh, I have written some jokes that I'm proud of, or some bits, some comedy bits. So I want to combine these things for for me, it's something that I enjoy doing. I mean, if we're saving the world, we might as well have some fun exactly, and, and, and yes. have some humor on the way doing well, it. Well, plus, humor engages people like nothing Absolutely. else. Absolutely. Humor disarms people and gets them to buy in, as we say, uh, much more readily than anything else. Absolutely. You see, I've done 220, 30 interviews with some of the smartest people around the world. Well, what am I doing here? And well, there's a very good reasons why you're here, but the question then is, one of the observations I've had is, and you feel free to agree or disagree with me, is that emotion eats logic for breakfast every time. In other words, uh, even the smartest people are first and foremost emotional and only then logical or even scientific. That's right, yeah. And plus, we all respond to stories, if I understand what you're driving at. Yes. And so stories are emotional. They evoke emotion. Exactly. But since Aesop's time, we've been telling stories to teach a lesson or a moral. That's right. That's not a bad thing. It's a thing. So, Bill, you're a scientist who's trying to save the world. How are you going to measure success? Scientists are all about quantifying things and measuring. So what's your litmus test? How uh, do we know if Bill, Guy, Bill Nye has succeeded or failed? OK. Uh, we'll see if we do produce all our electricity in North America renewably by 2050. That would be success. So that's your benchmark, 2050? That's, so we want to get 80% by 2030, mm -hmm. or 2035, mm -hmm. and then 100% about that much time again, another 15, 20 years. And I'm not saying that I would be single-handedly responsible, but I wouldn't have to do much more if we were able to achieve that. And how would you know if you failed? Uh, we don't. We don't be get renewable energy. We continue to excavate the tar sands, mm. and the world's population continues to agree to increase, and the standard of living of women and girls it does not increase. Some people in White Houses talk about this oxymoron of clean coal. No, clean coal is just not clean. Now, you can't burn coal. We have to stop burning coal. We have to stop burning tar sands, synthetic oil. We have to stop it. Uh, so everybody. My grandfather went into World War I on a horse. He rode a horse into battle at night around trenches. And he lived through it, which enabled me to be here. Yeah, that's incredible. But nobody goes into battle on a horse. Everything has changed completely. Yeah. So let's change everything. Don't come whining to me. We can't change. In big cities like New York and Toronto, Enormous concern about horse manure at the turn of the last century. Yeah. You see pictures that was shin deep, knee deep in some places of horse manure. And there was great concern about uh, the hygiene. And are, is, is the populace going to be able to sustain with typhoid and whatever other diseases would be extant and exacerbated by the heat and moisture and bacteria that grew in the horse manure? I think at peak horse, we had about 27 million of them, actually, or that's so. A, well, that's a lot. It, it is <laughs> totally a lot. But uh, that was revolutionized and went away. And there were people who worked the stables. There were blacksmiths. There were people who put on shoes. There were real estate developers who handled the mews or the stables. All that went away. It's not good or bad, it just is. So we can't mine coal anymore. Yeah, Gotta but, stop. Gotta yeah, do but, something else. But let me grab that thought that you say it just is. Because some people say we are the horse now. And just like the horse went away in the beginning of the 20th century, perhaps humanity is going to go away. And the, the age of the machines is coming now. Uh, so this idea, we're on the singularity show, right? Absolutely. And So is it a coincidence? Is it? That 
uh, Kurzweiler, what's his name? Well, we not only have Ray Kurzweil, we Ray have people Kurzweil. like Elon Musk, Bill Gates, Steve okay. Wozniak, Dr. Stephen Hawking, all of them being concerned that artificial intelligence may be the end of the human species. I'm not concerned. Why not? Does that, does that help you? Because humans make the machines. So sooner or later, to put it in old terms, somebody's got to shovel the coal to make the electricity to run the machine. Mm -hmm. That's a, the machines are going to create machines that are going to like provide the electricity and everything's going to work perfectly and it's all going to be really good and it's going to happen in the next nine years. Ray, really? Really? Isn't that when you're going to be 80 and so that's when you predicted it, hoping your brain would go in some electronic receptacle? Dude, no. And I mean, there are billions people? of people, over a billion people in the world have never made a phone call. Not never made a cell phone call, never made a phone call. So things are just not, it's not going to be that revolutionary most places. So we're worrying for nothing then? The word worry, just keep in mind that humans design the machines, so we want to design good machines. Yeah, but Martian McLuhan, Another Canadian has said that first we build the tools and then the tools build us. Well, okay. So, and, he said and, the medium and, and is we're the talking message. about the most powerful tools in the history of humanity. Tools that eventually may be able to think on their own. Okay. And, and then the question is much better than us at everything we can think of. Okay. So Do that's you want to have sex with, with a machine or with another human? There are already people having sex with machines, yeah, both virtually for a long time. and physically, by okay, the way. They don't reproduce as fast, though. Well, humanity... So go ahead. Just because it could happen doesn't mean it will. You but, don't but have you to slide down But you grant me it's a possibility, the then. Well, you, you, in other words, you don't necessarily slide down the slippery slope. I'm skeptical, that's all, especially about these extraordinary timelines. 2029. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah. what is that, 12 years from now? Right. No, no. Three presidential elections from now, humans will be gone and machines will run everything. No. Well, we're not saying humans will be gone by 2029. We're talking about the Turing test and humans equal, equal or machines equaling human intelligence. Yeah, well, right. we'll see. I'm open-minded, but skeptical. Okay, so let me shift our conversation here a little bit then. If artificial intelligence is not the main issue here, right? And you often talk about your parents and how they had to fight Nazism in World War II. Your grandfather fought in World War I. They all My had father their fought the Japanese, actually, the Axis. Yeah. My mom worked on the Nazis. Very well, yeah. She was a, a, a decryptor. Yeah, yeah. Right. By so, all accounts. So they all had the big issues of their time. So if not artificial intelligence, then what are the big issues of our time? The three for me are clean water for everyone in the world. Okay. And that will almost certainly, in my opinion, involve desalinization. Of course. Uh, in an environmental responsible way. Mm -hmm. uh, renewable, reliable electricity for everybody in the world. And then access to electronic information, to gl the global internet. And for that, uh, we're almost certainly going to need space assets. The internet will be provided to remote areas to what are now be called the developing world with low altitude satellites in an extraordinary constellation that hand the internet service from one to the other in a way similar to how we hand mobile phone calls from one cell to another. It's cool. It's very cool, but all of those things to happen, people say we need artificial intelligence for. Sure. And, and in other words, people have said that whether it's you know resolving the water crisis situation, desalinating water, or creating abundance of energy, or anything else, we need artificial intelligence for it. Even global warming. So in other words, people are saying artificial intelligence is more important because it will be like the silver bullet, if you will, in technology terms that will allow us to resolve all those other outstanding problems. Yeah, so that's good, isn't it? It is, but I mean, it usually comes as a full package. Technology is a double-edged sword, right? It can create, but it can destroy. So, and especially if it's all-powerful like AI. Okay, so hang on. I just take exception with the following usages, which I hear plenty. Please, yeah, please. Technology is going to do this. Yeah. Science is going to do this. Yeah, I think we're on the same page, but, uh, but keep going. Science is not a thing. Exactly. Of itself, that has free will. Technology doesn't have free will. We make technology. 
Yes, there are an enormous number of us, a very large fraction of us, use technology without knowing how it works. I'll give you that. But it, come, it came out of somebody's head. A human created it. So when I go to the airport and I ride from Terminal A to Terminal C on a train, it has artificial intelligence that determines how many people are on board, how much they weigh, how much their luggage weighs how much energy it takes to get it going, how much it needs to slow it down, when the door should, and I'm fine with that. Isn't that good? When my mobile phone works as I drive around town from one cell to another, there's an artificial intelligence system that hands it from one to the other, yeah. The question is, if I understand it, will the phones decide that the artificial intelligence of the phone decides that it should mess with humans? Uh, it could. I just don't think that'll happen. I think it'll be accidental. Well, that's the, the sort of, if you forgive me, the most simplistic level of analysis, because perhaps one other question is, let's say we have self-driving cars. I what happens to those five million drivers tomorrow? Right? That's the bigger question. I'm not worried about right now, are they going to come and kill us, those self-driving cars? I'm more worried about, are those drivers today what horses were at the beginning of the last century? Yeah. And that was my point. Okay, but hold it, hold it. I don't think the drivers are the horses. The gas-powered cars that require an auto, a granted, human to operate them granted, are the horses. Yeah, I have granted, no problem with that. Granted, absolutely. But let's talk about science, because you brought it, and, and that's a perfect segue for my next point. Let's talk about what is science, first of all, and what are the limits of science? So for me, science is the process by which we know nature. Okay. Yes, it's a collection of facts, or you associate a collection of facts with science. But for me, it's the way of knowing. And the old phrase to, that was replaced by the word scientist mm -hmm. was natural philosopher. Exactly. Somebody who thought deeply about nature. Yeah. So it's the, it's the way that we know how nature works. So the premise of the bit in science is... We're going to start with the assumption that there's no magic. This is to say, there is nothing unknowable. It, doesn't, it absolutely does not mean you know everything. The premise is anything you want to know can be pursued with this process. You make an observation. You stroke your chin. Wow, what happened? You design a test. You test it. You compare what happened with what you thought would happen. And then what is perhaps the most important part of that whole process? You start over. You start with a hypothesis, you, you make a prediction, a you make a test, and if it confirms That's or right. denies it, Now, you when adapt. we run up against a wall and find that there is magic, okay, bring it on. Yeah. But so far, we haven't come close to that. In fact, the, the exact opposite or reciprocal has happened in every claim of the paranormal or magic or woo-woo. Every claim has been debunked and the scientific or natural philosophic explanation is far more satisfying and interesting and just enchanting, just cool, compared with the supernatural explanation. Yeah, I agree absolutely, of course. I'm a big fan of science myself, and by the way... You should have a podcast. Oh, you do have one. 40% right. of my blog audience are PhDs, about 60% of them have a master's degree, and 93% are college or university Good. graduates. Uh, but... But we need to reach everybody, even people who don't choose to get a four-year degree. I agree. They should all watch my podcast and watch your show and watch the documentary by Jason and David. Yes. Um, but let's talk about um, two things, actually, that, that pop into my mind here. We already touched about the importance of uh, telling a story. And Yuval Noah Harari says that, for example, physics is nothing but the story of how things in the universe came to be. And chemistry is nothing but the story of how the elements came to be. And biology is nothing but the story of how living organisms came to be. And history is nothing but the story of how people came to be together. And, and well, okay, so... So, Let me just say, this is somebody's charming aphorism or turn of phrase about what biology, chemistry, and physics are. Okay. That, I think there, I wouldn't describe the facts of the periodic table as a story. 
But if this guy wants to do that, knock himself out, go ahead. That's the setup. Go ahead. Yes, and, and the bigger point is, is this, actually. It's the follow-up, which is science, just like technology, is in a way the how, or it's the tool. But it's, yeah. it's hardly ever the why or the what or the where. Those are judgments that come from outside of science. Well, maybe. But here, let's talk about the periodic table for just a beat. Sure, of course. To me, the periodic table is not the story of chemistry for me. Now, this could be my uh, narrow-minded view of the word story. The story for me is uh, uh, Mendeleev predicted that these elements would be discovered. He predicted how much their densities and how much they, uh, their boiling points, their melting temperatures. That is astonishing. That is a cool story. I agree, and especially the fact that he did it while he was sleeping. Or so he says. Maybe he was yeah. drunk, but all good. Maybe he, he's Russian, so possibly. <laughs> but, but he came up with it in his sleep. Shut anyway, so uh, yeah, uh, let's go back on topic. But see, those, that to me is a story. Or, or um, but how oh, doggone it, I'm together. not a chemist. Who discovered benzene? Uh, 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 I'm under pressure, everybody. But the guy who discovered benzene yeah, he said he dreamt of having a snake bite its tail, and he realized carbon atoms could hook together in this configuration that had this duality. But, but one would say the way those elements fit together actually is because of a story based on the atomic weight or what, it, what happened. Okay, okay, Just like a... history's events, the, we had uh, chronicles, which was basically chronicling all events without any story. But once we have a story connecting the different events, we immediately start having history. Okay, and before okay. that, we have chronicles. And the bigger point I'm trying to drive at here is ethics. Because you see, my blog is actually not about technology. I love science. I'm a big fan of science, but I'm a philosopher. And I'm a very simple philosopher in the Socratic school where I want to talk about, is science enough? And my argument is technology or science is never enough. It's necessary. It's not sufficient. And what we need is ethics. And that's inescapable because science or technology never makes the choice about what is good or where we should put our resources first. By science, you mean scientists? Both, right? The scientific method so doesn't tell you what no, to investigate no. or what's more important no. than what. So I, yeah. Right? But those are value judgments that come out of ethics. And okay. my, Where does ethics come from? Right. From probably metaphysics, perhaps, or, or epistemology. Epistemi Here's my claim. Yeah. Okay. That not only are your size, shape, whether or not you have hair or not, a result of evolution, so is what you feel. It's an extraordinary claim. Of course. Okay, so there's all kinds of uh, psychological tests that have been performed. If you move closer to somebody, you tend to like them more. If you're compelled to move away, then you like them Should less. I move a little well, closer whatever these are for example, the house is burning. Do you save your kid or do you save your mother? You save the kid, and you can't help it because that has the, the best chance of getting your genes into the future. If you in this grim zero-sum game, you got to save one. Okay. So my claim, as on my claim, the claim is the, that these feelings are a result of evolution. And so, if I understand your parsing this deal, this uh, discussion, this way or that way, ethics also comes from evolution. Ethics is deep within us. Furthermore. Your chance of success of passing your genes on depend what, depends on what tribe you're born into. I had appendicitis. In some tribes, I would have disappeared. I would have died. Not, but I lived in a society, a tribe, that has hospitals and infrastructure. We took your appendix out and say, here's my bill. OK. Similarly, I claim that a tribe that has a sophisticated set of laws that has come from debate, philosophical discussion about ethics, has a better chance of passing its genes on than tribes that don't. And that's so, my point, kind of, I'm driving at. But I would go even further in that. Even further. Say, bring it on, I Nicholas. would say it doesn't stem from evolution, because true ethics would be one going above and beyond the urges of evolution, or biology, or spreading your gene pool, or however you want to put it. And in fact, 
True ethics comes in a moment where you get to do what's the right thing, even when it's against your evolutionary survival or against your example. personal interest. Well, we can talk about one of my favorite guys, Socrates, for example. Okay. He had the chance to run away. He had the chance to walk and, and live abroad. Uh, but he decided to drink the hemlock poison and he died, mm -hmm. right? For him, that was not the best thing, obviously. Why? But it was the right thing but to do. But we're still talking about it. So his ideas right. survive, was it 5,000 years? What do we got? We're in 3,000 years. 2,400 years or so, yeah. yeah. That's all? Yeah. He was 600 BC? He was about 400 BC. Yeah, that's just the take. other day. Yeah. It's just so recent. Yeah. So he took a chance. He wanted his ideas to live a long time, so he went for it. Well, you that's could... That's one explanation. Sure, but you could argue that his ideas would have lived on anyway, and he didn't have to die that yeah, day. Yeah, I know. Why not leave? Right? Why, why not? Yeah. But, but his ethics dictated to him that if he served Athens all his life, then he was bound by that service to also go the other way around, which is to accept the sentence imposed on him by okay. Athens. So, and that's ethics to me personally. That's when it, when it even doesn't pay to you economically, or otherwise you do the right thing okay, because so it's the right thing. Just hang on. So we were going to talk about science. Science and technology and the end of the world as a result of artificial intelligence. Exactly. Now we're talking about Socrates ending his own life for some reason that because, he thought was valuable. Yeah, because my hypothesis is and I want to get your take on this, that All it's right. the ethics that makes the difference. Whether you're going to make a nuclear bomb or you're going to make a nuclear power plant. It's the same technology, it's the same science. For example, Albert Einstein was grossly disgusted that some of his best friends and colleagues, the smartest people in the world at that time, didn't see any contradiction at turning around their research and creating weapons of mass destruction to kill people during both World War I and World War II and totally didn't see that as any contradiction, right? They were phenomenal scientists, but I would say personally they had very poor ethics. And in my claim, furthermore, it's that thing that makes the difference whether we would survive or not as a civilization. All right, hang on. So let's so, hear Bill Nye on this. So my mother was graduated from college in 1942, Baltimore, Maryland. The dean of students was Dorothy Stimson. She was the first cousin of Henry Stimson, who was the U.S. Secretary of War. My mother was recruited. Apparently, Henry said to Dorothy, do you have any ladies that can come work on this thing? I can't tell you what it is. My mom worked on the Enigma Code. Yeah, she was a pioneer. And, and, well, they were classified for 50 years, so I'm not really sure what she really did. Did she just pour coffee for the admiral? Or, but she subscribed to Cryptography Magazine. She was in Mensa and she got a doctorate. So I guess she was good at something. But she told us, look everybody, there, at that time in 1945, there was no discussion about was it ethical to drop this huge weapon on strangers in Japan. People in the, in the Allies were, and the U.S. especially, were terrified of Japanese military. They had a repu the soldiers, Japanese soldiers, had a reputation for fighting to the death, never surrendering. Yeah. And I remember delivering the Washington Post. The Code of Bushido. Uh, yeah. In 1964, where a guy was on an island, a Japanese soldier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Held the faith. After the war was over, For still decades. waiting, yes, yeah. Yeah. still living off the land in a tropical paradise, living off the resources of a jungle, um, waiting for word to whether or not to continue fighting the war. So my mother said, there was none of this ethic, was it the right thing? Drop it. Do you have another one? Drop another one. Like, get it over with. Because nobody wanted to send a million people into the island of Japan, islands of Japan to try to finish this thing off. So it's better if we kill, let's say, 300,000 well, so, with two words, bombs? It wasn't clear that it was necessarily wrong. These people were desperate. They, my mother's generation were terrified. And the Japanese people were very, the soldiers of the military, it was very motivated. It wasn't do you buy a question that argument of whether it was the right thing to do. What? Do you buy that argument yourself? Well, just I'm presenting it. Yeah, yeah. 
accusing the scientists who are trying to save what they perceive as a better constitutional government, uh, judging them for producing a nuclear weapon, when the alternative was probably sending about a million guys, men, young men, to their deaths, they saw it as uh, a reasonable thing to do. The other belief was that once these films were sent to the Japanese government of these nuclear explosions they taking would place in the Kenya, that the Japanese military would take it seriously and surrender. Yeah. Like, sorry, man. But it, the, I think that weapon was so extraordinary that they didn't believe it, didn't believe it was a real thing. Yeah. Didn't believe the Wright brothers could fly planes, whatever it was. It seemed incredible. It seemed like uh, um, something that was generated through cinema. Furthermore, a question for you historians, why didn't the Japanese government surrender after the first weapon was, why'd they go 10 days? What in the world? So uh, in other words, in that one case, for me, my personal experience is not so clear cut that they were doing the wrong thing mm -hmm. by making these weapons. So uh, one day, I'm walking down the street, minding my own business, sitting at my drawing board. And uh, we were working on a navigation system for business jets. And this is going to be inertial navigation before global positioning was trusted or allowed for commercial aircraft. And it was going to be one third the size of the competitive product already on the market. So one day, my boss comes to me and says, will this fit in a Tomahawk cruise missile? <laughs> so That's the value judgment I'm okay, talking about. Okay, so I'm at a drawing board, yeah. uh, which is how it was done in those days, before electronic, uh, let's see if it fits. I laid it out with a what we used to call a scale. It's like a very precise ruler. Yeah. Compasses and things to within 20 thousandths of an inch. And I said, yeah, it'll fit. So did I do the wrong thing? Should I have thrown down my lead holder? They're not called pencils. Should I have thrown it down and stormed out of the office and quit? Or should I, as a US citizen, ask, will this fit? Uh, yeah, it'll fit. And did that become a bargaining chip for our company to motivate Boeing to make cruise missiles, which enabled uh, several presidents to have a standoff military presence? Like, OK. It's not so clear cut, is all I'm saying. I didn't throw down my pencil. It took me all week, and I, it would fit. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, and I, I'm not presuming to judge anybody else's ethics. All I'm saying is that it always comes to play at the most important moment. So for me, for example, it's disappointing that people didn't consider the ethical implications be before throwing two bombs and killing 300,000 people. OK, but. And today, knowing what we're capable of, and having the power we have to destroy the Earth multiple times over, I hope we have better forethought oh, so, to, to consider the implications okay, of our so actions. With and that said, learning from history, I'm right yeah, there with you. Yeah. Nobody needs nuclear weapons. That's right. the lesson we could learn from this. Right. Nobody needs them. In fact, does anybody really need weapons at all? Like, wow, dude, like, let's all just, you know, be friends. Well, okay, and we hope to get to that. So my claim for you to evaluate is if we had clean water, re reliable, renewable electricity, and access to the internet for everybody in the world, there would be less conflict. People wouldn't ha would have less to fight about. Would they get to everybody if we had those things? Because you could say, right now, we have enough clean water, and we have enough food for everybody, and we have enough technology to build houses to house the whole population, mm -hmm. and yet we have a billion people starving, we have two billion people not reaching fresh water. We have everything with the present day technology for those people to get everything they need to get right now. So it's we not don't a technological problem. Precisely. Yeah. Right? And that's, and that's... It's a supply chain management problem. Furthermore, it's a problem about governments, right? What is important to people? If you have a dictator that wants a big palace instead of feeding his populace, that's bad. Uh, but that's bad and that's good. Those judgments are exactly where ethics comes in. I'm and with that's, you. So where does ethics come from? Right. And that's as I said, metaphysics or epistemology. 
right? That's my claim, depending on where you start from. So if you start from the Bible, your ethics will derive from the Bible because your, both your metaphysics and your epistemology would derive from that book. Like scientific guys like you and me, they would not start from the Bible, hopefully, and we would have a better place to start with, but it doesn't mean we're going to end in the- in Okay, the, here's the problem though. People who start with the Bible think it's not a better place. They think you're wrong. Exactly, and that's where the power of humor comes to play because we can break through those fortresses uh, where we fail with logic, with humor we can break through because an emotion and music are things that are so powerful. The movies that your friends David yes, and Jason made. Yes, the most made. important movie ever made, I think. You could make a strong argument. I agree, and their previous movie, The Immortalist, was fantastic too. I was, Brilliant. I was yes. a big fan. Uh, but hold it. So where do ethics come from? If I may, as the interviewee, ask the interviewer, I'm saying ethics uh, have emerged through human experience through centuries or millennia, and tribes that have that are you're giving us the evolutionary amoral. biology argument. Yes. Well, I claim it's a strong one. It because, is because for sure. But is it the only one? Because the stories well, that bind us are more powerful than the biology. Okay. Well, so back to the premise of science, as I understand it. Okay. The premise in science is there is no magic. There is nothing unknowable. No, we agree. There is an at no, as far as we can tell, absolute truth outside of us. With the exception, the enormous exceptions of what we call in physics or science natural laws. So there is, mm -hmm. if you're a fish of reasonable size, if you're this long, most of what you eat are other fish. Almost all of what you eat are other fish. You have to go way down the fish food pyramid to get to fish that are, have a plant-based diet. What, are those unethical to, fish? Let, let me give you a counterexample. I get exactly what you're, what you're going after, but think about it this way. If you go to a chimpanzee and you tell to the chimpanzee, give me this banana and you're going to go to chimpanzee heaven, mm -hmm. the chimpanzee would never give you the banana. How do you know? If you go, because first they don't have the concept of heaven, second they would not be so silly ever to give you something they have in their hand for something that doesn't, they can't see, smell or touch. But if you go to a human being and you tell, the, not only give me that banana, but die for me, kill for me, move your house for me, do anything you else you want for me, and you would go in heaven, many people across our planet will do it. That's the power, and, and against their biological incentives. Okay, let me try and this. And that's the power of narratives that I'm trying to get at. Okay, let me and that's ask why you movies are so important, that's why books are so important, that's why hopefully podcasts are important too, and what you do. So let me ask you this. When I go to the zoo, which happens from time to time, there's a bonobo, there's a gorilla sitting there. Yeah. And there's one guy who was at the Seattle Zoo, the Woodland Park Zoo, and he would just look at you, his name's Vip. Is that the guy throwing stones at people? No, no. There was one guy like but that. But he's just looking at you. Okay. And you can, he's thinking something. Okay. And I think he's thinking, dude, what is this? You are skinny, you have no hair, and yet, you losers out there have me in here. Like, what? What has happened? Yeah. I could break you. I could tear you limb from limb. Absolutely. And I'm a vegetarian. I'm not even going to do that. But he's thinking it. So I, what I'm into right now for you to consider is there's a gradient of consciousness. There's a gradient of self-awareness, a gradient of awareness of others, and a gradient of empathy, or what others need. And I, uh, starting with primates, is, that's where I, re I really began thinking about it. But so, would you then, you use the term, some people would give up everything and go to heaven. Do you think there's a gradient of ethics, that certain human populations, certain societies are more ethically advanced than others? I would not go to the degree to say that I wouldn't use the word advance. I would use the spectrum. Okay. Like a color spectrum or a sound or okay, a light spectrum. Is, a, people is, one spectrum, is one end of the spectrum better? 
Or I would not use that the word better, personally. I, and that's the judgment, right? Okay, so but, you said the scientists who blew up the, who created the atomic bomb, where were they on the spectrum? The good well, side, the bad side? Well, Oppenheimer changed his mind, so he became a pacifist, for example. Okay. So I, I'm not here to tell other people what to think. My point is to be a Socrates. So if I've done my job right, hopefully, I would at best be a midwife to people giving birth to their own ideas. But my job is to lay out the full spectrum. And then my audience picks what they want to associate with and what they want to do. Okay. And I'm not here to teach them or tell no, them but anything. But you're telling me that ethics are important. Yes. Okay. Were the people who worked on the atomic bomb, who did not become pacifists, were they unethical? I personally would not call them unethical, if you're asking for my personal yeah. opinion. I would say that they lacked forethought in many of the consequences or understanding of how powerful a change they are okay, able so to did do. So my mother, was my mother unethical for enabling the sinking of no. enemy submarines? No. Was um, she unethical for thinking that dropping the nuclear weapon to avoid having millions of allied soldiers die, was she unethical? No, I, I wouldn't call them unethical. I, I would say that I hope they had they considered their implication. And that, by the way, it happens, I think, often for scientists tangled in the details of the science, often don't look at the big picture quite often, which is why, for example, the science working on microprocessors always think that they're never going to make the next step of Moore's law and it's lasted for 35 years or so. We have some debate whether it's continuing or failing right now, but the people in the nitty gritty are always enmeshed so deeply in it that it's hard to, to zoom out and look I at the big I picture. I think that my scientist friends, I think, are deeply thoughtful, very thoughtful, more thoughtful than other people I associate with. I agree with that. Okay. And, and, and Unfortunately, we're running out of time. That's cool. This so, has been fun. So, we, what's the? We haven't solved the ethical question of the universe. We're, we're, Doggone we're, it. We haven't. But let me ask you, from your point of view, the one last and most important thing, perhaps, that you'd like our viewers and listeners to take away from this conversation with Bill Nye, the science guy today, what would that be? Thinking deeply is good. Discussing things like ethics is good. Furthermore, we can solve the world's problems. We can feed the world's billions. We can have clean water, reliable, renewable electricity, and access to worldwide information for everybody and raise the standard of living of women and girls. So the world's population slowly decreases, a population who slowly decreases over the coming centuries and increase the quality of life for everybody in the world. Let's go, we can do this. I couldn't disagree with that. Bill Nye. Thank you, Nick. The science guy. Or should we do... Do you have black tea just from the tea plant? I have English breakfast. What's the other one? Uh, Earl Grey. Earl Grey. Uh, sure, a tiny bit, but it's not the most important thing. All right. And I think your tea is ready to, to go oh, here. Oh, man can dream. So that's, that's man the... Man can dream. That's our welcome for uh, you in thank Canada. You, thank you. You got an apple box yeah. kind of thing here. Watch okay, out. Uh, he's going to set it down. Yeah, he's going to see if that's in there. Yeah, that's going to be safe there. And then, yeah, you can probably bring it in. How's that? Well, that's okay. good enough right there. That's no, it's not, no, it's not. Okay. It's working. Guys. Thanks, you guys. Thank you so now, much. You guys, I've been talking the last few hours, you know, so thank you for this. Okay, guys, time is precious. Let's get going. Absolutely. Yeah. I need 45 minutes with the man on my show, please. With laughs, 43 minutes. I think it's okay. Oh, that's good. All right. Hot tea in Canada, people. Come on. We got speed? Yeah. Give me some shreddies. <laughs> How about a coffee crisp? <laughs>